Welcome to Grow a Cook and Eat It. This is our second episode. First of all, Coley and I want to thank you very much for the warm welcome of the first episode, and we really appreciate all the feedback. We're going to be incorporating it into the series. The series is about taking what you've grown, taking what you've cooked, and sharing it with family and friends. And today, the main ingredient or the main star is kale. I'm going to show you how to grow it, but I'm also going to talk about pest management. Kale is really easy to grow, and you can grow it in most, most parts of the United States, really all over the place. But it's subjected to a pest called the green cabbage looper, and if you don't take care of it, it's going to devastate your crop. Coley has five tips for you for using it in your kitchen. Let's get started, and I'm going to start with pest control. Kale in my area is bothered by two pests, really, well, three. Snails and slugs and the green cabbage looper. For snails and slugs, you're going to get lots of holes in your leaves. I don't have too many in here because I've been putting down iron phosphate. Oh, here we go. So this damage is from a snail, from a slug, combination of both. Iron phosphate pellets will take care of the snail and slug problem in your garden and it will let your kale form beautiful leaves. The other pest is the green cabbage looper, which comes from that white butterfly that flies around psychotically in your garden for months and months. Here are some transplants, and these were all transplants. Holes are in here, small holes, big chews in the leaves. If you start looking around, and the thing is, is the green cabbage looper, caterpillars, those type of uh, worms are taken care of with Bt or neem oil. I use neem oil now, and it really works. And you can see the holes right in here, and if you can see right above my thumb, hopefully it stays in focus, that's the green cabbage looper. And one white butterfly can lay dozens of eggs on your leaves. Here's another example, it might be a little bit easier, on the underside of the leaf. Green cabbage looper. And they will come and they will decimate your crops. You know, one butterfly will just land all over the place. If you see one, there's a dozen. And if you don't treat for it, again, that's the looper, and it will get twice that size, three times that size. And there's the other one. If you don't treat for it, it's going to shred your leaves down rather quickly. Uh, those are white flies, and they go on the undersides of leaves. A lot of times you find them, this is uh, Brussels sprouts. On Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbages, plants in those families. But they can also go on tomato plants and different things. But just look at all the white flies. And as I tap it, you see them really flying around. They also lay lots of eggs. So you're going to treat this with the way I show you today, and you're going to do it every five days, um, another two times. So you're going to do it, say, today, and another five days, and then ten days. And the reason that you do that is because most insects, especially, well, white flies like other insects, lay eggs. So if you just treat it today, you're not necessarily killing off the hatching eggs. And you can see them all under there too. So you do it three times so that you kill off the adults that are flying around, the eggs that are on there, and hatchlings. And they're just everywhere. So the first thing that you do, see if I can do this one hand, is just get a hose. Best thing is to take the nozzle off and just use your thumb like that and just spray it down. So everything's been sprayed down with a jet of water, about one leaf. I just want to show you something for contrast. So that spray will really get rid of a lot of the white flies. And you can see that leaf earlier was covered in white flies. The leaf down here was covered in white flies. Here's one I didn't spray. Let's see if I can move that. And you can see there's a white fly right up there by the nozzle and some other markings from the white fly. The water will wash this all off. Next thing you want to do is get a quart bottle, and in here, like I said, there's one teaspoon of dish soap, one teaspoon of, I'm actually using olive oil. Any kind of oil will work. The oil will cover the eggs and the insects and smother them. The fine mist of oil will get on the white fly wings and they're not going to be able to fly. You could use neem oil, which will also uh, spray a chemical on here called azadiractin, which if other insects eat that chemical when they're chewing on the leaves, it will kill them off. But you don't need to do that with the white flies. So each leaf will get sprayed, and you can see that the water becomes cloudy. That's how you know the soap has dispersed the oil through the water when it gets cloudy. And just spray it down just like that. It takes a little bit of time 
but it's well worth it. You'll be able to take care of the white flies. And again, you're going to do this every five days. So today would be day one, five days will be the second spring, five days after that will be the third spring. And the reason that you do that is because you want to kill off the white flies, of course, but you want to interrupt the entire life cycle. If you just did this once, there's a chance some eggs will survive, the white flies are just going to come back. So by doing it three times, you really take now, care of the kale is pretty plant. easy to grow, and you can actually see that white moth. That's the moth that lays the green cabbage looper, and it just happened to fly in. That's what you want to defend your kale against. Anyway, kale is really easy to grow. I'm growing three varieties. I'm growing a red Russian kale. This is a Vats Blue Dwarf Curled Kale. And this kale has a lot of names. It's called uh, Lacanado Kale, Tuscan Kale, Tuscan Cabbage, uh, Dinosaur Kale, um, Flat Black Cabbage. It goes by a lot of names. But it's just got this nice crinkle texture to it. There's all kinds of different varieties. I like to mix these three together because they just look very different. They look great in salads and they look great when you're cooking with them. Kale is extremely easy to grow. The spacing, anywhere from 10 to 12 inches. If you're growing something with a bigger leaf, you could go 12 to 18 inches. Feeding is really simple. Whatever you want to do. Set it up with lots of compost, no compost. Use 10-10-10 chemical fertilizer. Use all organic. It doesn't matter. Kale loves to grow. Because it's a leafy green, you do want to give it a liquid fertilizer, soluble fertilizer every 10 to 14 days, something high in nitrogen, whatever again you'd like to use. But it's really easy to grow. This is one bed that I have set up. The curled kale there, the black kale here, the red Russian kale. This is plenty of kale right here for a family of four. Let me go show you how I seed start it, get it into the ground, and talk about planting it in containers. Kale is really easy to grow. It's easy to seed start. You can start it indoors. You can start it outdoors. It can take a frost. It grows great spring through fall here in Maryland Zone 7. It can take the heat. Again, it can take the cold. Any basic fertilizing plan really works with this. You really can't go wrong. Let me just show you a couple ways that I get it seed started. These were started five days ago and they've already sprouted up. This is red Russian kale. And when they get, you know, maybe to about I don't know, that size, I'll thin them down to one plant. And if you're growing them in here after two or three weeks of sprouting, make sure you give them a nice liquid fertilizer to keep them growing. They are leafy greens. When they get to, I don't know, maybe about that size, when I'm doing them indoors, I put them into cups. And then this would be my transplant. Now, if you haven't started kale yet and you want to get it going, when it gets to about this height in here, just put it right into the ground and you'll have kale for the rest of the season. If you don't have room for it, you can grow one kale plant in a five gallon container. Just set up with whatever soil you want, with whatever you know mix of fertilizer in there that you want. And again, these guys, because they're leafy greens, every 10 to 14 days, give them a liquid fertilizer that has a good dose of nitrogen in it. A lot of people don't know that kale is a biennial. Most of us grow it as an annual. We plant it in the spring, we get rid of it in the fall. I'm in Maryland zone 7, and in zone 7 through 10, where you get a nice cold season, a nice winter, kale can actually take a good freeze, and it's going to come back in the spring. So being a biennial, the second season, it's going to flower. It's going to send up all kinds of flowers and buds, and Here's some examples of the buds. You can eat these. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the buds. They taste delicious. They taste a little bit like broccoli. After you let it continue to grow, it's actually going to produce all these seed pods. And you will get literally 10,000 seeds from a single kale plant. This one's been growing about six weeks. So I've eaten most of the buds off of here and most of the flowers. So it's really getting into the stage of creating seed pods. Let them go and in about two to three weeks you'll have enough seeds to last you for, I don't know, 20 years. These are a couple more red Russian kale plants up on my hill. And these vary from the plants that I just uh, showed you in that last clip. And in fact, in that last clip I said it was growing for six weeks. I meant to say that I was harvesting the flowers and blooms off of it over a six week period. How these plants uh, differ is the plants that you just saw were fully mature plants come October, November of last year. So when the frost and freeze hit, they were already mature. They survived and come spring, they knew that they were mature plants and they just went crazy and put out hundreds of flowers, 
hundreds of blooms and you know I got to enjoy them. The plants that you see here actually seeded in September and come October, November they were only about this big. So they survived the winter but come spring they thought they were immature plants just getting started. They didn't try to create flowers or blooms and they just grew and then when they get to size most kale plants are just going to send up a single flower stalk like a lot of greens do and you're not going to get nearly as many blooms or as flowers and, you know, versus the clip that I just showed you and it's going to look something like this. So in the warmer zones you're going to plant, they're going to grow, you're going to get a flower stalk like this, it's going to be done. But in, in zone 7 through 10 you have that unique opportunity to let a mature plant survive the winter and come spring you're going to get hundreds of blooms and flowers. I also wanted to talk about the nutrition of this plant. Kale's been called a superfood, you know, for the last couple of years, and we all know that as gardeners. It's a, it's a wonderful vegetable. It's packed full of iron, packed full of calcium. In fact, if you have dairy issues, you can use this as an alternative. It has fatty acids, vitamin K, vitamin C, vitamin A. It's just loaded with nutrition. And Coley's going to show you five ways that you can use it in the kitchen. I also want to ask you to go to her channel, Coley Cooks, her YouTube channel, and subscribe because Grow It, Cook It, Eat It is going to be hosted on both channels over time and I don't want you to miss any of the episodes. Thank you, Gary, and thanks everybody for tuning into our second episode of Grow It, Cook It, Eat It. Now kale, it is a superfood, it's packed with nutrients, and in the garden it's like the gift that keeps on giving. You cut a little bit and it grows some more. It's heat tolerant, it's frost tolerant, it just really doesn't get any better than kale. Here are my five best tips for preparing kale in your kitchen. First up, clean it. Kale is dirty because it grows in the dirt, and rather than just running it under the faucet, which never really gets it totally clean, this is the best way to do it. First, you want to remove these tough stems from the kale. They're really fibrous, they don't really taste all that good, they're really tough to chew and digest, so just get rid of them. You can always compost them, right? So I do this by holding on to the stem, and then take my thumb and index finger and wrap it around the other part, and then just pull. See? So you have the stem in one hand, and then you have your leafy greens here. I'll show you again. Stem, index finger and thumb, pull. One more. Stem, index finger and thumb, pull. It's as easy as that. Next, you want to take those kale leaves and submerge them in a basin of water. You want to use a big bowl with plenty of water for the kale to swish around in, and you want it to be nice and cold. Don't use warm water for this. Put it all in there, give it a little swish and zhuzh around, and then let it hang out for just a couple of minutes. In that time, all of the dirt and grit is going to settle to the bottom of the bowl. So when you're ready, don't pour the kale out. You want to lift the kale up out of the water because if you pour it, all of that dirt and sand and grit that fell to the bottom of the bowl is just going to wind up back on your kale and defeats the whole purpose. Step number two, dry it. After you wash your kale, it's going to be sopping wet, which doesn't work well in recipes and it really doesn't work well when it comes to storing your kale because the wetter it is, the faster it's going to go bad. Now, drying it off with some towels just isn't really going to cut it. You can use a salad spinner, but I like to do it the old-fashioned way. I take all of my kale and I put it either into a clean, really big tea towel, a sack, or even a pillowcase works. Then I take it outside and I swing it up around my head and that centrifugal force is going to cause all of the water to get whisked away from the kale. It's a really cool trick and I do it all the time. When you bring the kale back inside, you can take it out of the sack, wrap it up in a couple paper towels, and then just pop it into a Ziploc bag like this, and seal it up, try to press out as much air as you can, just like that. So you can store this in the refrigerator for up to a week, sometimes even more. It'll stay nice and fresh and you can use it in all of your favorite recipes. Tip number three, massage it. Yep, I said massage it. Anytime I use kale in a salad or another raw application, I always make sure I give it a good massage first which helps to break down some of the fibers and makes it a lot tastier to eat and also makes it easier to digest. All you have to do is chop the kale into pieces, drizzle it with some olive oil, give it a good sprinkle of salt, and then just get your hands in there and really work the leaves and work the oil into the leaves until they've kind of changed texture a bit, they darken a little bit in color, and you can see that they've really lessened in volume and have broken down quite a bit. I have an awesome video recipe for a summertime kale and blueberry salad with sunflower seeds and a little lemon vinaigrette. I eat it all the time in the summer because it's fresh, healthy, light, and even better, it's 
easy. I'll be sure to put the link for that recipe and video right down here on the bottom of the screen and also I'll make sure I put it in the description as well. Tip number four, roast it. When you put kale in the oven, it gets nice and crispy and makes these kale chips, which you've probably heard of or even had before. Kale chips are a really healthy, tasty, and totally addictive snack that even your kids will love. All you have to do is coat the kale in some olive oil, sprinkle it with a little bit of salt or any other seasoning, and roast it in a low oven for about 20 minutes, depending, and it'll get nice and crispy and makes for great snacking. I have another video recipe for these kale chips, so be sure to check it out. You can find that link at the bottom of this screen or again in the description. Tip number five, hide it. Even if you don't like the flavor of kale, you can still reap all of the amazing benefits by hiding it in a nice fruit smoothie. Believe it or not, even if it's a bright green color, you wouldn't be able to tell there's any greens in there at all just from doing a blind taste test. I like to throw in plenty of banana because it has a really nice sweet flavor in addition to berries and yogurt and lots of other good stuff. Buzz it up in a blender and then drink it up. It's perfect as a breakfast on a hot summer morning because it's cool, refreshing, it's filling, and it gives me tons of energy. With all of that fruit, you'll never taste the greens, but you'll still get all of the benefits that kale has. It's high in iron, calcium, magnesium, vitamin K, A, B, and C. So what do you have to lose? Thank you guys again for tuning in to our second episode of Grow It, Cook It, Eat It. I hope I've given you some awesome ideas on some different things to do with kale. Gary and I so appreciate you watching our videos. Please leave us a comment and let us know how you liked this video. And we'd love to hear what kinds of fruits and vegetables you'd like to see featured next. See you next time. Welcome to Grow It, Cook It, Eat It. This is our second episode. First of all, Coley and I want to thank you all for the very warm 